so Josh, I mean, do you, do you do baseline CT scan? Do you do it with contrast? Um, how soon do you try to start the Dervalumab? Do you have trouble patients getting through the one year of Dervalumab? So um, what I tend to do is I schedule a four-week visit with me after the chemo radiotherapy has completed. And at that visit, they will have had a scan before they see me with a planned treatment chair that day. I think that baseline scan is really important. I have had patients who ha did not have the scan at another institution, and then the subsequent scan shows progressive disease. Like, well, is the Dervalumab helping? Is the Dervalumab not helping? You do another scan, now the cancer is getting smaller. So now I have patients with metastatic disease who are on Dervalumab for which it's not FDA approved. And that's sort of difficult to change because they're responding. Um, when I tried to move up the scans and initiation of Dervalumab to two weeks, which was within the forest plot, was associated with the best benefit, I saw way too much pneumonitis. Now it's completely anecdotal, but I had five for five and the nurse practitioner I work with threatened to punch me in the face. If I said I need to avoid getting punched in the face. And so we pushed it out to four weeks. I haven't Did seen you? that. I mean, we do it at, we scan it two weeks. Maybe my nurse practitioner is just more gentle. I think it's, but, I think it's the pacifist nature of Nashville. I think that's the issue. Is that <laughs> really gotta watch it. I think we, we are more scary. I think th that's definitely true. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> but uh, we we uh, we start a lot of patients between two and three weeks, and I, I have I haven't seen that, so I'm I'm going to start looking for that though. Well, I'll say to that that I mean that ends up being kind of a hot topic is how early to really push it, and I'll say I don't put a ton of stock in the earlier uh, earlier starting treatment doing better. I imagine that some of that is just patients who are in better shape can also start it earlier. Um, so if someone is having any kind of complications after chemo radiation or having any difficulty recovering, I do still try and, and, and get them to recovery before starting Dervalumab as well. But I like, the, I like this structured two week, four week, um, everyone coming in and getting a scan and Josh having them set up for treatment that day. Uh, I, I like that, that structure that you described, but I don't feel in uh, uh, anxious about getting them treated earlier either. And what's your chemotherapy regimen that you choose? And do you ever give it sequentially for patients that can't tolerate concurrent? Uh, well, I mean, as far as the chemo radiation, I think the concurrent cisatoposide or carbotaxol uh, are both fine. Um, I, I, I agree with Leora's statement earlier about weekly carbotaxol and now not doing the two consolidation doses, which was my practice previously, and, and it's nice to be able to drop those because that, I think, ends up adding more toxicity. The weekly is pretty well tolerated, and then, and then starting to value map. I'll say to the earlier question, uh, I do tend to see more problems uh, pop up or side effects from ongoing Dervalumab through a year, and it's not uncommon for me to have to hold a dose and sometimes put people on steroids for pneumonitis. Uh, so I, I, I am seeing more, more side effects from that as well. And speaking of side effects, just in terms of what we were discussing before, and I know, Tim, you and I have discussed this previously, I, I don't know that we can reliably say that some pneumonitis is radiation-induced, some of it is IO-induced. If you look at the work by Dr. Naidu, which looked at the radiographic features of pneumonitis, it's highly variable. And so I don't think that we can say just because it's in this area, it is the radiation, and just because it's in these areas, it's not the radiation. I tend to treat it just as pneumonitis, which is treatment-related, and based upon your work, Dr. Uh, Tim, as well as um, as well as prior work, I feel comfortable after the taper of steroids in the pneumonitis setting of re-exposing to IO. The prior series found a rate of safe retreatment of about 75%, and that's consistent with what your real-world data showed, Tim, of 80%, that we can safely go back on. The one exception is that if someone is really, really sick requiring the ICU, okay, maybe I shouldn't do that. Um, but in general, I've had good results being able to re-expose patients to IO. And Tim, um, tell me about the radiation dose. Wasn't there some recent data that high dose wasn't better than lower dose or regular dose in, in concurrent patients? I mean, do you, what's your dose that you use? Yeah, so you're talking about RTOG 0617, which is a randomized 
phase three study looking at 60 gray versus 74 gray. You know, we as radiation oncologists like to think that more dose is always better, uh, but actually the inverse was true and, and in pretty remarkable fashion. The five-year data just came out uh, at JCO and the high dose radiation arm was statistically inferior in terms of overall survival by I believe 10 or 11%. Um, so uh, excessive dose in the mediastinum we know from numerous historical series uh, causes cardiac related morbidity and mortality um, and we need to be judicious both in terms of uh, localization of our, of our fields but also radiation dose. So you know, in the current context most people are sticking with 60 maybe 66 gray if you've got a relatively modest volume of disease. Uh, but the days of pushing to 70 gray and beyond, um, we've learned our lesson.